Hey guys, JC Perez here, founder of allstarcharts.com and welcome to uh, the JC show, I guess is what we call it, where we go over, you know, some important trends and see what's really going on in the market. You know, we're price oriented. We deal with facts here, so we don't really care, um, you know, what analysts think and we don't care what the government thinks and we don't care about the economy, right? We're looking at price. We understand that there are ec economic implications to those price changes, but we're more interested in the price changes, not so much the economic implications. That comes afterwards. Before we get into the charts, make sure to go check out my recent podcast episode with Kimmy Sokoloff, who's also a CMT. We're trained in very similar ways. She received her CMT like in the 90s, um, but we've been friends for over a decade. She's fantastic. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that, you know, when, when you know, we're looking at markets, we're looking at weeks and months, right, out into the future, right? That's sort of my time horizon that's where i live kimmy looks out hours and days right so she has a much more short-term time horizon um the markets are fractal so the same principles that we're using on weekly and monthly charts you can incorporate uh on intraday charts and kimmy does a great job of that uh, so go to technical analysis radio just look up all-star charts on your favorite podcast player make sure to do that all right cool so uh, transports have really been selling off, um, you know, in the last uh, week or so, very aggressive. Uh, they got up towards the top of the range, got back down to the bottom of the range. Now let's see if what direction it's going to break in. Here in particular, we're looking at monthly closing prices. So there's no real divergence to speak of between the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Dow Jones Transportation Average. Uh, the, the relentless strength in utilities, folks, in the face of rising interest rates is something that, you know, I really don't think we can ignore. I think that's probably something pretty powerful. So when you include the utilities in the Dow averages, so you've got the Dow Jones Composite Index, which is what we're looking at here, which includes 65 stocks, all 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, all 20 stocks in the Dow Jones Transportation Average, and then you've got 15 stocks in the Dow Jones Utilities Average. And there's a reason why this one looks stronger than the others is because the others don't have any utility stocks and utilities have been ripping. Again, in the face of rising interest rates, you'd think that in a, low, in a lower rate environment, there'd be more of a reason for fixed income investors to go get their yield in the stock market, giving that relative bill in, bid in utilities. That's not what we're seeing at all. We're seeing utilities rip with higher interest rates. So when you look at the Dow Jones composite average, it's a range bound market, it's a messy market, which I think makes sense. Like if you ask most investors, would you say that this is a messy market or not a messy market? Most people I think would say it's a messy market. And this chart really shows that, doesn't it? You know, people would say it's a messy market, but we've been in a long-term uptrend for a long time. And now it's a messy market within that. And I think this chart really describes that really well. Um, okay. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out is with new lows in a lot of indexes uh, in the first quarter, um, this is a, a, a broad measure of stocks. We're looking at the Russell 3000, so it includes all 2000 stocks, all 2000 small caps in the Russell 2000, and then you've got the Russell 1000 large cap. So you got 3000 stocks in here. And with new lows in the indexes, we saw fewer stocks making new lows, right? Fewer components making new lows. We actually got a couple of days uh, last week, or, or you know, to, to, to end the quarter, start the new quarter, Couple of days where we actually had more stocks making new highs than new lows, which is something we hadn't seen in a year, uh, all year in 2022, we hadn't seen that yet. So here we're looking at the new highs minus the new lows. This is New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, by the way. So with new highs in the S&P throughout most of last year, we were seeing fewer and fewer components making new highs. We were seeing more and more of them making new lows. And then throughout the entire year, uh, 2022, we've just seen more stocks making new lows and making new highs, right? Um, this has been a downtrend for most stocks, not all stocks, but most stocks. And then notice how with higher highs in the S&P, fewer and fewer stocks were making new highs and more were making new lows. Well, what we've seen this year is with the S&P 500 making lower lows in price, we are seeing fewer and fewer stocks making new lows, right? So sort of breath improvement throughout the first quarter, uh, which I think is interesting. The fact that we we still need to make more new highs than new lows. Otherwise we can't have an uptrend. More stocks need to be making new highs than new lows. I know it's kind of like, yeah, JC, I get it, common sense. Yeah, common sense, but like, 
that's real. You just need more. <laughs> you need, I, I mean, I feel like a lot of people are lacking that common sense. Like, yes, you need more stocks making new highs and new lows for this to be a bull market, right? So when people are like, oh, JC, are we, are we gonna enter into a bear market? And it's like, well, almost half the stocks on the NASDAQ got cut in half, right? Uh, over 70% of the NASDAQ was down over 20%. Some might call those bear markets, right? Over 70% of the NASDAQ was down 20%. You know, the, the average drawdown on the NASDAQ uh, is about 46% average drawdown. So this is over the last year, since February of 2021. So if you're asking me if now we're gonna enter into a bear market, like, what do you call that, right? What do you call that? So these things have gotten smoked. We've seen a lot of relative strength out of the more cyclical areas, which is what I wanna point out here. The more cyclical areas that tend to do well when interest rates are rising. And guess what has been happening to interest rates? They have been rising. So here on the Y axis, we're looking at the year to date return. On the X axis, we're looking at 52 week drawdown. Look at the ones on the upper right. Look at the ones on the lower left. On the upper right, you got your energies, you got your metals and mining, uh, you got GDX, steel, uh, oil and gas explorers and producers, natural gas stocks. These are all the ones up here, right? Uh, agriculture, rare earth metals, master limited partnerships, copper miners. These are all the best performing areas. What are the worst performing areas? Social media, biotechnology, technology, uh, cyber, um, uh, cloud computing. These are the worst areas in the market, the growthier areas. So when interest rates are going up, the cyclical, more value-oriented areas are the ones that tend to do well. And the growthier areas, the archy names, as we like to call them, tend to underperform. We know that throughout history. This isn't the first time interest rates have been going up, by the way. Maybe some of you youngsters, this is the first time you've seen interest rates going up, but I would encourage you to go back and, and look at prior cycles. And those of us that have a few more gray hairs, I got them in here somewhere, they, uh, they're uh, from, from prior cycles, right? Being frustrated by certain things and you remember. And I remember in the 2000s, cyclicals doing very well. We want it to be in energy stocks, big international industrial conglomerates, Walter Energy and uh, Peabody, um, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns. These were the types of companies we were buying in the 2000s. Technology stocks were an afterthought. Growth stocks were an afterthought. Like you don't wanna be in those things. I mean, they went up a little bit, but they were underperforming the whole way. It's the other ones, the materials, the mining stocks. That's where we wanted to be in the 2000s. By the way, interest rates were going up then too in the mid 2000s. So this time, this period has really reminded me a lot of that. And this bubble chart, I think really tells that story really, really well. Uh, something else, you know, uh, you know, you gotta, like, like uh, an old intern of mine once told me, you gotta, Juan, you got to give the people what they want. You got to give them what they want. They want to talk about the yield curve. I guess everyone's a yield curve expert now all of a sudden, which is, um, you know, hilarious. Um, people just woke up last week or the week, you know, whatever inverted the week before recently when it inverted and they're like, oh my God, the yield curve has inverted. What are we going to do? Our pets' heads are falling off, right? And I'm just thinking to myself, yeah, it inverted, inverted today. It could have been yesterday, could have been next week. We didn't know what day specifically it was gonna happen, but the yield curve has been flattening for over a year. So like, you know, it's like watching like a, a, a slow motion, like you see it coming. It's just a matter of like, oh, is it gonna be Thursday or Tuesday or next Monday? Like it's coming. And then it just so happened to be a week ago or whatever. Great, so what? when the yield curve inverts stocks do very well so i don't know what everybody's so scared about yeah sometimes it precedes a recession so what we're focused on the price of assets the economy the economic implications come later price moves first then the economy and then by the way just because the yield curve inverts doesn't mean stocks need to start selling off in fact the s p 500 peaked in 2007 in the uh, in October of 2007, I remember specifically, I think it was October 11th or something like that. If, if I got that right, that's pretty damn good. But it was somewhere time in October for sure, maybe October 21st, something like that. Uh, the yield curve inverted in the fall of 2005. So if you were selling stocks in the fall of 2005 because the yield curve inverted the two's 10 curve, 
you missed out on two monster years. So if you're shorting stocks, if you're bearish to stock market, that's fine. But the yield curve inverting should not be the reason for that. You, you should have other reasons uh, if you're shorting, uh, right? And then the other thing I would like you to take a look at is the uh, the three month, right? So instead of using the twos, tens, you're looking at three months versus tens because the three months is what the Fed's doing. The, t the two year is what the market thinks the Fed is going to do. Right. And here we are seeing new new lows, right? Flattening yield curve on the two stands, seeing new highs. Uh, when you look at what the Fed is actually doing, you know, some would argue that the blue line is the one that you want to look at, not the orange line. Uh, but nevertheless, stocks tend to do well uh, while the yield curve is inverting and uh, afterwards as well. So great. We can move on now. One thing I definitely want to point out is the dispersion that we saw this quarter, the most dispersion that we saw since Q4 2000. Q4 2000. So here, this is the difference between the best performing sector and the worst performing sector. So the best performing sector was energy. What else is new? The worst performing sector was communications. Again, what else is new? And I laugh about it because, you know, people have been telling me the entire quarter that oil and gas stocks are overbought. Energy was the best performing sector in 2021. Communications was the worst performing sector of 2021. So now what happened in the first quarter of 2022? Energy was the best performing sector. Communications was the worst performing sector. Like, hello, trends persist. Like, maybe not this obnoxiously, because <laughs> it's pretty obnoxious, but um, nevertheless, reiterating that yes, in fact, trends exist. That's why technical analysis works, because we're looking for trends. Uh, so this is the most dispersion, the highest dispersion in returns from sector to sector in one quarter since the fourth quarter of 2000, over 20 years ago. Uh, so fascinating, right? Fascinating. So this is what we call alpha, right? Because if you've been in technology and communications, life's been rough, right? It's been rough, rough living. But if you've been in natural resources and metals and mining and energy, you're like, what bear market? What are you guys talking about? What do you mean new 52 week lows? Like, what are you babbling about? It's a completely different world. You can see these sectors, right? So here, energy got off January, got off, started uh, strong, continued through February, another seven spot in, in February, put up an eight spot in March, up almost 38% for the quarter, monster quarter, and then just uh, further deterioration in communications, consumer discretionaries, technology. Uh, these things have just been an absolute mess. Um... The other thing I wanted to point out is really the difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Here you can see that the New York Stock Exchange that by the end of the quarter was only down less than 4% from new 52 week highs, while the NASDAQ was down over 11% from new 52 week highs. And then the median stock in the NASDAQ down 33% from its highs, while the median stock in the New York Stock Exchange much less. So the big difference is in New York Stock Exchange, you're getting much more international exposure, a lot more exposure to cyclicals. What the problem with the NASDAQ is you're not getting any exposure to cyclicals, no financials, nothing international, you know, no or not a lot international, um, nothing, um, uh, nothing energy related materials, nothing materials related, right? So that's going to be uh, the big difference, right? And then by the way, the S&P 500 is probably somewhere in the middle. You know, it's got some flavors of the NASDAQ, got some flavors of the New York Stock Exchange uh, is really how I see that. And then overall, we're still in a risk off environment uh, through and through. You know, when you look at our list of very important intermarket relationships, things like copper gold, Aussie yen, uh, stocks versus bonds, stocks versus gold, utilities on a relative basis, staples on a relative basis, uh, regional banks relative to REITs, uh, uh, you know, transports versus utilities, emerging markets versus developed, like all of our risk on risk off indicators, we aggregate them all and we're currently in a risk off environment, which I guess you don't really necessarily need this chart to show that we're in a risk off environment. You know, things have, you know, really kind of shown, you know, tip, it, tip its hand, uh, if you will. Um, you know, we've been in a relatively risk off environment, certainly not a risk on environment. It's not like we've been in a raging bull market by any means, except for a couple of different sectors. Um, so for the most part, I think we can all agree that it's been messy to down, right? So where's the big winner? Bond market's been pointing to higher inflation, has it not? Right, so when looking at inflation protected treasury securities relative to nominal, uh, we're making new 10 year highs. You know, I don't really trust people. You know, I have a hard time trusting most people. I trust dogs and I trust the bond market, right? That's how I live my life. You could live your life differently. 
you know, I'm more skeptical of humans. Uh, dogs, dogs are good. Dogs are great. Uh, bonds, good, good information out of bonds. So I don't think you need the bond market to tell you that inflation is kind of a thing these days. Uh, but the bond market is telling you that in case you were wondering, uh, which makes sense in this environment. Here we are, the S&P 500 is making new three-year lows relative to the CRB Commodities Index. So what does that mean? That commodities are making new three-year highs on a relative basis. So when you're asking yourself stocks versus commodities, you know, some people have convinced themselves or let some fool convince them that commodities are not an asset class. Can you imagine the irresponsibility to approach the market as an investor believing that commodities are not an asset class? Can you imagine how, how bad your recency bias needs to be to believe that? Like, why, just because commodities sucked for the last decade, that means they're no longer an asset class? Like, what about the decade before that? What about this decade? Like, yeah, I get it. Commodities were terrible for the last decade. Well, guess what? Growth stocks uh, were terrible the decade before that, and commodities were great the decade before that. So, so just because you're recent, you just because you're, there are people who are just too mentally weak, just too mentally exhausted, and just can't overcome their recency bias to the point where they actually believe that commodities are not an asset class. Can you imagine? Those are probably the people that are in the communication stocks and in the technology stocks and is still thinking that this is 2020 when it's like two years later, folks, right? So it's, it's, you know, the unwind in that mentality is the catalyst. So when we're talking about why technical analysis works, why markets trend is because of these human behaviors. There are investors who still think that this is a different decade. Like they still think that. Some investors think this is three decades ago, but that's another story. It takes time for humans to believe a new narrative, right? We have our egos and we have our uh, preconceived notions and to change our mind simply because the market has proven that is very difficult for people. For me, it's easy. I, but because I had to learn that the hard way. For me, it's easy. I'll change my mind. I, all I know is that I know nothing. I don't have no idea what's gonna happen tomorrow. Couldn't tell you. Um, but I can tell you where the trend is and what the higher probability outcome is. And I will also tell you what the market would need to do to prove that thesis to be invalid. I will tell you all of those things. So copper breaking out to new all time highs, right? These are not characteristics of downtrends. We're talking about a 10 year base in copper. So when you're looking at different types of stocks, where do you want to be? Where do you not want to be? Freeport McMoran making new 10 year highs continues to be a monster winner you know, anytime things get volatile, we've been selling downside volatility, collecting premium, you know, risk reversals have worked out well in this stock. Uh, I think that we're going back up towards 61, those all time highs from before. And check out Southern Copper, SCCO. This one's not, hasn't been a buy yet, but it's, it's digging in there, it's getting ready. If we could break out above 80 in Southern Copper, I think you gotta own it, target up near 114. Uh, I like Southern Copper a lot. Um. The agribusiness index in general continues to act well, breaking out to new all-time highs after a 10-year base. So these are not the commodity futures. These are the stocks that are in the business of agriculture. Think Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, um, think uh, John Deere, right? I uh, think these stocks continue to make new all-time highs. They don't look like technology. They don't look like those Arky names that Kathy Wood buys. They don't look anything like that. They actually look like those stocks upside down. Don't shoot the messenger, it's just what it is. So the stocks that are in the business of agriculture, commodities folks, natural resources, these are the names that are winning. Look at Archer Daniels, Mid and Deer, they keep making us money. Look at this, uh, these are chemicals in general. So when you talk about materials, you're talking about chemical stocks. Here's Sociedad Química y Minera de Chile. So it's gonna be a lithium chemicals uh, sort of scenario. Gets you out of the United States, one of the worst performing countries in the world and gives you exposure to Latin America, one of the strongest areas in the world. You know, we wanna be buying any weakness. Obviously this broke out above 67. It's been a big winner for a while, but I still think it goes higher and a great representation of what's happening out there. Uh, check it out, Lind, there's another chemicals company also working out well. This is an ADR from the UK. I think this one goes to 400. So that whole space, and of course the rare earth metals.
right? So the rare earth metals, we want to be buying any pullbacks down towards 100. I don't know that we're going to get another shot anywhere near 100. But if we do, I think you buy it. You know, I think these things are heading higher. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the green metals, as we call them, things like cobalt and things like that. Uh, take a look at those. And of course, energy. Oil and gas continues to act well. Uh, CRB index is a lot of energy, you know, over a third energy for the CRB index. So that's been doing well. And then Chevron and Exxon, you know, uh, I think that Chevron's going to overtake Exxon in market capitalization. The relative strength is impressive. The truth is, if uh, Chevron does well, Exxon's going to do well, too. So it's going to be hard to catch it. But I think it does. Uh, but if you're in one, I think the other one's going to work. Just as Chevron was easier because Chevron's already breaking out to new all time highs and Exxon still has some work to do. So that's why I always like Chevron better. Not always, but in this cycle, I like Chevron better. In prior cycles, I liked Exxon better, right? To show you how things are different. Uh, it's just been a, a cleaner trade, cleaner trade for sure. Of the, uh, of the energy names, it's really the explorers and the producers. For me, over the oil services, more recently, we have certainly seen strength out of the oil services, but it's the explorers and producers for me. You know, Oxy hit our target, all, all that former support uh, from 2016, right? Hit our target has really been consolidating near this 60 level. I think a breakout is coming. I mean, Warren Buffett's in. Uh, he got like some fancy warrants because he's Warren Buffett. Like if I call Oxy and I ask for warrants, they're not going to call me back. But good old Uncle Warren, um, what a beast this guy is. Uh, he gets special treatment. You know, I remember back in 2008, early 09, something like that. Goldman Sachs was like minutes from going bankrupt. And, uh, and Buffett gave him like $10 billion or something like that. But he got this sweetheart deal that they called at the time a, perf a perpetual preferred uh, where he got like all these warrants if the stock broke this price and all these things, like it was crazy and he made a fortune. I had never heard the term perpetual preferred prior to that moment. And I haven't heard the words perpetual preferred ever since that moment either. So it was literally something they invented uh, for Warren Buffett in that particular occasion. So what he's doing with Oxy today is not that fancy, um, just pretty traditional warrants, but nonetheless uh, bullish. What about Chenier, another standout for us uh, has been near and dear to our heart. You guys following along, like kudos to you. This has been a beast. If we're above 140, I think you own it. Uh, Chenier Energy, LNG, target up near 163. This thing is a beast. And then I really think, I continue to think it's not anything new. This could really be the trade of a generation. And I know it's pretty dramatic. It's like, all right, JC, bro, settle down with your trade of the generation. Relax. I know it's a pretty obnoxious, but I mean, the one thing that you can argue against is that trends in commodities relative to stocks, trends in energy relative to growth stocks, these are not like swing trades. These aren't things that last days or weeks or months or even quarters. These trends historically last a decade. And if we're in year two, you know, I'm not like a math major or anything, but it seems to me like there's a lot more room to run. And then when it comes to identifying, okay, great, JC, trade of a generation, blah, blah. Where are you wrong? What does the market have to do to prove that thesis to be invalid? And I would say this is the chart. When you're looking at energy, so energy is the numerator, technology is the denominator. As this chart is going up, energy is outperforming tech. As the chart is going down, tech is outperforming energy. Now, remember that tech represents like a quarter of the entire S&P 500. So this is really just betting on energy on a relative basis. Betting on commodities on a relative basis is sort of the theme that I want you to take out of this. So the low down here was March of 2000. Those of you who are around are fully aware of what took place that, that, part, that month. For you youngsters, I encourage you to go look at it. That is when the internet bubble burst, if you will. That was the top. And uh, that's when tech got absolutely smoked. The Nasdaq lost like 90%, something ridiculous. And uh, energy went on to, to be the leader uh, over the next decade, commodities in general, right? That was early on in my career. Well, we broke below that in 2020, and now we're back above those levels. So as long as we're above those 2020 lows in this ratio, the bet is long energy over everything else, particularly technology, particularly growth. This is where we want to be. I don't think that most investors, especially American investors, are prepared for oil at $250 a barrel. And I'm not saying it's going there, 
I am per being perfectly honest. I have no idea what oil is going to do. Oil traded below zero a couple of years ago. So I bet you didn't have that one. <laughs> I certainly did not. So these things could do anything. So just to be clear, I don't know if oil is going to 250. Oil can go to 1,000. I have no idea. The point is, I'm trying to make here is that as investors, when we approach the market, I think we need to approach the market knowing that that is on the table. Oil at 250 is a possibility. Gold at 5,000 is a possibility. I'm not saying we get there, but I think we need to approach the market assuming that's on the table as a possibility, okay? And by the way, I do think that happens. <laughs> but what do I know? I have no idea. But I, I mean, that's certainly what I'm betting on. Uh, I'll let the market prove that otherwise. Uh, Newmont Mining, new all-time highs. How long have the gold bugs been waiting for that? Jesus, talk about a terrible trade for decades. Like people have like lived an entire life without seeing Newmont breaking out, you know? And the gold miners dug in, right? 31 bucks, that was the level. It wasn't pretty, but they dug in. And then here's gold, right? Closing the month above those 2011 highs. How about that for gold? How about that? However, however, there's always a but with gold. I feel like there's always like a but. You know, we're seeing some relative strength compared to stocks, right? As stocks of volatility has risen and, and gold and silver have actually been more stable. Great. But we are not seeing that relative strength in gold compared to commodities. We're seeing new lows in gold relative to commodities. Gold and, and silver are just not able to keep up with the rest of uh, energy, uh, agriculture. They're just not able to do it. And then silver hasn't broken out either, still in this range, right? So if silver, if, if precious metals are gonna do well, historically you're gonna see silver outperforming in that environment. We're not doing, we're not seeing that yet. By the way, if you're interested in these slides, make sure to email info at allstarcharts.com. That's info at allstarcharts.com. Use the password support and resistance. So if you're interested in the slides, use the pass. make sure to use the password support and resistance. Otherwise, you're gonna get some other random deck. So support and resistance, email info at allstarcharts.com and we'll go ahead and send that out to you. I asked somebody what the, uh, what the best uh, monthly chart they saw. Uh, and they said uh, the Bitcoin monthly looks pretty bullish. I think it was Sean, actually. Sean McLaughlin, Chicago Sean. Shout out, shout out to Sean. Interesting, right? Looks basic to me. Up two months in a row. How about Luna breaking out to new all-time highs? Nice base. You know, what I always liked about Luna is that if it's above 100, you own it. And if we're not above these former highs, you can't own it. Because what do we know is from failed moves come fast moves in the opposite direction. That's what we know. So if we're above 100, we want to be long Luna. Below 100, we do not. And then the other thing that I'd like to mention is the U.S. dollar index. Right? Everyone's like, oh, strong dollar, strong dollar, strong dollar. There's a big difference, my friends, between the U.S. dollar index and the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar index is 70% euro and yen. And the euro and the yen have sucked. Like, there's just no, they, they just suck. They wake up in the morning and they start selling. They go to sleep, they sell some more. They wake up, they start selling. Nobody wants euro or yen. So if the dollar index is 70% euro and yen, what do you think it's going to look like? It's going to look like this. However... Like, like gold, there's always a but. However, when you look at the other currencies around the world outside of the Euro and Yen, because I don't know if you guys know, but there are other countries that are not in Europe or in Japan. I don't know if you guys heard. It's like, a, it's like this whole planet. It's insane. You should look it up. It's wild. So when we take a look at the 30 biggest currencies, we'll take, a, we'll take the other 29 outside the dollar. The dollar. These include Chilean peso, Filipino peso, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, Indian rupees, Aussie, Kiwi, Canadian dollar. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think you get the, the idea. With new highs in the dollar index, meaning new lows in euro and yen for all intents and purposes, new highs in the dollar index, 
lower highs in the advanced decline line when you include all those other currencies. So the US dollar is actually getting weaker. The US dollar index is getting stronger, but that's just because the euro and the yen suck. The dollar, the United States almighty dollar is getting weaker. So I think you need to be careful with that. And I just wanted to finish with that note. Hope that uh, adds some value. If you're interested in the slides, again, make sure to go info at allstarcharts.com and, and use the password. Don't forget, use the password support and resistance. Any questions at all, shoot me a note. I am your gracious host, JC Peretz. And uh, to quote the great philosopher, Jay-Z, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with me and I appreciate that. So thank you. Go drink some champagne. It's good for you. Adios. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.